This week uh, in, in Brussels, there seems to be only one name of a country outside Europe, and that is Moldova. How come? How come all of a sudden Moldova is the name of the foreign policy game? Well, first, I'm delighted to hear that it's not about the United States and the debt limit, um, which, you know, is uh, is embarrassing and is what is being covered in the U.S. I suspect that you're not completely correct um, and that Moldova is not actually getting quite as much attention um, as you're suggesting. But but there are reasons uh, for it. Uh, I mean, two real reasons. The first, of course, is the next steps in the EU member state candidacy, since both Moldova and Ukraine both achieved candidate status last year. Georgia, of course, did not. So I guess not many people talking about Georgia right now. Uh, and the second um, is the accusations of Russian interference in Moldova, uh, which has been a developing story really since February uh, this year. And, and that has gotten some traction, not very much in the United States, but is important and a place where the Russians feel like they can have some leverage. And there are, of course, Russian troops on the ground in Transnistria. There are, of course, a pro-Russian opposition inside Moldova. Uh, and there have been accusations of direct Russian interference, including uh, potentially a, a Russian-supported coup. Hasn't gotten a lot of traction in terms of details, but nonetheless matters. So I think all of those things are are driving the conversation. Okay, but I mean, so the question is, how how important do you think, as a matter of fact, is Moldova for the European Union just strategic position? Um, well, it, it's not as important as Ukraine, obviously. Uh, it's a vastly smaller country. Um, and uh, the challenges of uh, Moldovan integration into the EU are difficult politically because you would have a country with a significant pro-Russian party. And I don't think the EU is going to be happy with consensus-driven decision-making mm -hmm. in that environment. But with Ukraine, for example, I mean, literally, if you bring in Ukraine, every country of the EU becomes a net contributor J just because of agricultural needs, just because of the comparative poverty of Ukraine. Moldova is a tiny economy, so you don't have that problem. So I, I, I think that in the grand scheme of things, uh, I would be surprised if we were talking about this again in the same way in a couple of weeks. I mean, we are having a summit, right? The 1st of June, like everybody, yeah. 40 leaders are sort of coming in Chisinau and like pretty much everybody that is on the A-list. I mean, Sunak, Macron, et cetera, are going to be there, uh, which obviously the next question is how important could Moldova be? I mean, perhaps you have already answered it, but how important could Moldova be for the Kremlin in the context, in the current context? Oh, well, for the Kremlin, of course, let's keep in mind, uh, Russia has virtually no friends on the international stage right now. They have a lot of countries that are still doing business with Russia and happily so, but that's different from saying that they consider themselves aligned with Russia. I mean, even the Central Asians, you're seeing a great deal of concern about we don't want to be under the Kremlin's thumb. Now, in the case of Moldova, of course, uh, the Russians see their influence in that country as, as rightful, as historic, as a matter of pride and principle and projection of power. Um, they, of course, want to create problems for the European governments that are supportive of Ukraine. And we've seen similar fomenting of tensions in the Balkans, for example, in that regard. Um, as I mentioned to you, the breakaway region of Transnistria still hosts about 1,500 Russian troops today. And that, that is a part of Moldovan territory. So there are Russian troops on the ground. Now, the Russians have no direct way um, to send additional troops to support them. Uh, and, and they're not all that well equipped or outfitted, but still it matters, right? It's a relevant point. And then, and then again, finally, the fact that there is a real domestic political opposition, uh, an active pro-Russian opposition in the country, um, which is growing in popularity right now because the Moldovan economy is doing quite poorly. And that provides a direct opportunity, one of the greatest opportunities for Russia to Russian interfere- interest. In, in Moldovan politics. So again, oh, I, I, I'm, there's a list of yeah. things that we care about. I just don't think that any of those really reach critical national security concerns for a von der Leyen, a Macron, a Schultz. Okay, but so the question the, the, the question is, I mean, we have seen actually the Moldovans, at least so is the claim, they have been more or less weaned from Russian energy. 
Uh, so in some sense, this is something for the EU to showcase, right? I mean, it, it's a massive show of political force, what we're seeing here. I mean, this many people uh, in a country that is essentially non-EU, right. uh, this is something that has to be made sense of geopolitically, right? Well, uh, you know, back in, I think it was November last year, the EU pledged over 250 million euros uh, after Russia cut off their gas supplies and uh, the United States has said they want an additional 300 million to support specifically Moldovan energy security. So of course it matters. Um, but you know, if you're putting this in the context of of German energy prices and and just how quickly the Germans have been able to reorient their economy off of Russian gas um, towards LNG from all over the world. Uh, on on trying to reduce and make more efficient uh, German consumer use, German industrial use, greater coal use. I mean, all of these things are considered significantly higher priority than anything we would discuss about Moldova. I mean, I think it, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's a great message to send to any country sitting on the fence as to how they would deal with Russian energy, right? Especially in the sphere of Europe. I mean, maybe not India, but certainly countries that are sort of a smaller order and that could be catered by European by European uh, money. Is that would that be a fair assessment, you think? Well, it's it's a fair assessment, but it's a one sided assessment. Uh, so you mentioned India, and I think it's interesting. Of course, India has radically stepped up their purchase of Russian oil at a significant discount since the war. On the other hand, Delivery of Indian refined products to Europe has gone up significantly over that same period. How much of that okay. is originally Russian crude that is now going through India as opposed to directly to Europe? Is yeah. that a good is that a good message? I mean, these ultimately, oil is a global market. Gas is not. So when we talk about gas, if the Europeans cut gas off, as they have, um, that means that the Russians have nowhere else to send that gas. They'll have to flare it. And indeed, the Russian prime minister has just left China and a meeting with Xi Jinping, hoping that the Chinese would provide some direct support to move on a gas pipeline to be built from China to Russia. And so far... The Chinese aren't having it. I think they want the Russians to get desperate. They want better terms from the Kremlin. So on gas, you can make that argument that truly the G7 and particularly the Europeans are damaging the Russian economy structurally. But on oil, um, on food, on fertilizer, uh, you can't make that argument. And, and okay, so you know, I think that's that's a better way to put it. So last question for you uh, is yeah. uh, Moldova uh, in the EU, yes or no? And if yes, when? Uh, fully in the EU, I'm going to say no. And I'm going to say no uh, for the same reason that it's so hard for Ukraine fully in the EU, which is you already see how hard it is to get European governance on track when you've got a country like Hungary and Viktor Orban that's able to cause trouble and leverage preferable outcomes on every issue involving ruler law or Russia or you name it. And, and you know, a country like Moldova, especially if a Russian opposition was able to gain uh, government, uh, which is wholly plausible, would be an existential challenge for present levels of EU governance. And so I suspect what happens is you open chapters, you integrate Moldova, this political and economic reform, which helps the Moldovan democracy. It helps the Moldovan economy. These things matter. But this is not the same as full membership of the EU. And, and, and when you talk to European diplomats, there's a very big distinction between a unanimous level of support for inviting Moldova and Ukraine into the EU and actually making that membership happen. Taking the step. Ian, thank you very, very, very much. It's always great talking to you. Uh, I will tweet.